hello and welcome uh, everyone to today's uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion panel event, which is entitled, Who Belongs Can We Afford to Be Different? It's quite a broad area and you're most welcome to uh, make the most of uh, what that offers. Uh, my name is Dr. Sunil Kumar and I teach in the Department of Social Policy at the LSE. Uh, I was the Dean of Graduate Studies for five years and I chaired the, amongst other things, chaired the Equality and Diversity Forum and I have a, a strong interest in equality and diversity issues. Um, and I think when we're talking about uh, the event, as you know it's part of the LSE's uh, festival, Beverage 2, which has been taking place since Monday 19th of February 2 and finishes on Saturday 24th. And as part of a whole year of activities at the LSE, rethinking welfare, the welfare state for the 21st century and for a global context as well. Uh, much of the festival has focused on reimagining the giant issues of housing and urbanization, education and skills, health and social care, the future of work and the challenges of poverty that Beveridge uh, identified. The events of the festival also encompass a focus on potential missing giants. And uh, personally, I think a, a big missing giant for me is a question of empathy and where does empathy lie in a range of things that we do. And today we'll be considering the question of belongings in society. How should we approach difference? How do we value diversity? And how should we support one another uh, in this uh, day and age? So that's broadly what the event is about. Uh, if there are any Twitter users in the audience, the hashtags for today are uh, hashtag LSE beverage and hashtag LSE festival. Can I ask that you ensure that your phones are on silent? Um, uh, it, it, sometimes it's nice to see different ringtones, but not today perhaps. <laughs> um, also to let you know that this event is both video and audio recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to there being no technical uh, issues uh, uh, at hand. The event is going to be divided into two parts. In the first part, uh, each of our four speakers will speak for about eight minutes, and I will try and keep them to time, uh, even if it means standing in front of them and waving my arms to say that your time's up. And this, the system we've used here of the question slips uh, it's something that I kind of um, came about as a result of going to uh, meet the mayor in one of those, uh, the events that was held in the, in the O2 arena, where people were roaming around asking a few or four questions. And also question time, where uh, people in the audience ask questions and are able to respond. So you have the slips in front of you, and please feel free to write a question down, and we will collect them and ask them in no particular order. So I'm not sure we can get through all the questions out there, but uh, as much as possible. And try and remember your question, uh, if not I can prompt you. Um, and when you ask a question, the speakers will respond very briefly, and then you'll have a chance to come back. Uh, I always feel that if you ask a question and don't have a chance to come back, it kind of leaves you uh, hanging about a little bit. Okay? So uh, that's how this is going to, going to work. Okay, uh, can I introduce you to our speakers today? Sorry. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brett has brought to my attention um, uh, something that he would like to just mention. And it's called silent appreciation. Visual, visual applause. Yeah. Visual applause, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, very lucky to have uh, some autistic people here as well, part of this um, uh, in the audience. And that, uh, one thing that's a normal practice in um, uh, these kind of events is to not clap because clapping can be uh, quite um, uncomfortable if you have hypersensory um, anxieties. So an alternative to that is to do silent visual applause, which is like this. Okay, uh, And so um, it's very difficult to remember this. Um, people will forget, but perhaps I'll, I can lead and you can uh, compliment can I just see everyone's silent yes. visual applause? Okay. Oh, Excellent, wow. fantastic. Oh, sorry, I didn't clap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's easy to forget, but yes. I'll remind you. So uh, very, very appreciated if we could stick to that. Thank you. Okay. Um, our speakers today. Um, 
Celestine Okoroji is a PhD researcher in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Sciences at the LSC. His research focuses on the ways in which ideas associated with stigmatized groups, such as unemployed people, become part of stig stigmatized group members' self-concept. Uh, Celestine's research was awarded the popular prize at the 2016 LSE Research Festival. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Bev Skeggs is Academic Director of the Atlantic Fellows Program in the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. Um, I'm sure you will say more about uh, what you're going to talk about. Dr. Jana Uha was a senior research fellow and a Marie Curie fellow at LSE from 2015 to 2017. She's now a senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich. Uh, we forgot to appreciate Bev, so let's... <laughs> <laughs> and finally, and not least, is Brett Heisman. He's a PhD researcher in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science at LSE. His research focuses on the public understanding of autism, for which he has won grants for collaboration and impact from the Economic and Social Research Council and the LSE. Brett is the creator of the Open Minds exhibition, which was set up to promote autistic voices. Okay. Right, I think without further ado, we should kick off uh, eight minutes. Uh, Celestine. Okay. Uh, hello and thank you all for coming. Um, I hope everyone can hear me at the back. Yeah? Good. Um, it's great to be here and it's an honor to be invited to speak at this event with colleagues coming from my home Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science and my home away from home, the International Inequalities Institute. So the title of our event today is Who Belongs? Question mark. With the subclause, can we afford to be different? So I will immediately answer those questions by saying first, unemployed people currently don't belong, or at least they are not seen as belonging. And this is the cause of much unnecessary pain and suffering. It also defeats the imagined purpose of the welfare state as it relates to unemployment. That is to say, welfare policy and the job center regime doesn't do what we probably think it should do, which is support people into work. So that's question one. Uh, as for question two, the question itself betrays at least one, in my opinion, fallacious assumption, though I suspect that's probably on purpose. The assumption is that we can afford to not be different and just go on indefinitely as is. I'll be arguing then that we cannot afford to stay the same in relation to how we do unemployment support. Okay? So what do we know about unemployment in general? Uh, well, we know that people who are unemployed have significantly lower levels of psychological health compared to those who are employed. Unemployed people are also twice as likely to be clinically distressed, uh, and unemployed unemployment sorry, is associated with an increased risk of suicide and self-harm. There is some debate as to whether there are selection effects in unemployment, meaning uh, people who already have mental health issues are more likely to be among those who are unemployed. That is true. However, we can't say that people in general become unemployed because of mental health issues. Rather, the best evidence suggests that unemployment promotes poor mental health. As I'm sure many, many of you well know, psychological stress, particularly chronic stress, uh, is related to a host of physical health issues such as high blood pressure, lowered immune response, headaches, and so on. When we talk about the UK in particular, we have to discuss the current rampant conditionality. As we are here celebrating beverage and the founding of the welfare state, it is important to note that for all intents and purposes, the welfare state was supposed to be a universal system, which gave citizens the right to access social security provision. However, what we now have is more like a prospect of receiving unemployment benefits, but only if you display the correct characteristics and meet behavioral conditions. I was lucky enough to be invited uh, to be involved in a panel in the in, uh, earlier on in the festival with, with Professor Peter Dwyer from the University of York, and he presented some evidence suggesting that the role of JCP is not to support people to find work, but rather to check that they have completed their job search requirement, which can mean applying for up to three jobs per day 
or 42 jobs every two weeks. In my early research, I interviewed many people who were unemployed or had previously claimed JSA, and I heard many similar stories, including having to continue to attend the job center even after being sanctioned. So meaning going to the job center even though you won't be paid your job seekers allowance. As I mentioned, conditionality doesn't just relate to behavioral controls, but also to psychological controls. People can be sanctioned for not displaying the correct attitude. This has been referred to as psychocompulsion in the literature. To receive your benefits, in spite of all I have just received, you may also need to appear happy. My work focuses on how, as a society, we allow such a system to perpetuate. Given the original idea behind the welfare state, pooling resources in order to pool risks. I have done a social psychological longitudinal analysis of political rhetoric concerning the welfare state, in particular unemployment. I don't have much time here to discuss all of the findings, but the crucial one here is the way in which politicians create dichotomies between people in work and people out of work. For instance, when John Major back in 1996 said that he hates the welfare cheats, or when we use phrases like scroungers, to characterize people claiming uh, unemployment support. This creates a clear boundary between us, the hard-working law-abiding citizens, as Ian Duncan Smith put it back when he was Conservative Party leader, and them, the lazy benefits scroungers. In social psychological terms, this kind of rhetoric creates a group of workers pitted against an outgroup of non-workers who are undeserving of support. And when we start to believe that the boundaries between the two groups are impermeable, that is, that people who claim benefits could never be us and we could never be them, it opens the door for both high levels of stigmatization and direct discrimination. But of course, this idea of them, the scroungers, and us, the hardworking, is a false distinction. Anyone who is not rich could, could lose their job and need to rely on the welfare state. After all, that is its purpose. So, how can we get social security as it pertains to unemployed people to work properly? Well, in the first instance, we need to recognize unemployed people as being the same as we are, capable of hard work, intelligence, charisma, confidence, leadership, and so on. But more concretely, we need to get away from the idea that we can shame people into work. Although I don't have the evidence now, my hunch is that stigmatization which unemployed people face directly reduces their ability to find work. We already have evidence that in domains where groups are stigmatized, the understanding that others think badly of us can <coughs> reduce our performance. But the organizers have also given me license here, whether they know it or not, to think a bit further into the future and a bit more radically. Because even if we got rid of the sanctions regime, and made the job center system more geared towards helping people into work rather than assessing the amount of job search activity they do, people are still likely to be stigmatized because they claim benefits. One way around this would be by introducing a universal basic income. Now, in some ways, this is controversial because there are many parameters to think about, such as the actual amount it is set out, how we can change income tax in line with that, but at the level of welfare policy, what happens to job centers or whatever their equivalent would be? Because of course, the assessment element becomes unnecessary. But we would still want some kind of support for people trying to find work. What UBI would do though, is remove the possibility of intergroup relations where on the one side, we have benefit claimants and on the other side, we have everybody else. The concept of the benefit claimant would cease to exist altogether as it presently stands. And I believe this is the best possible outcome for anyone who finds themselves out of work and needs support. Before I finish, there, are also, there is also another reason why universal basic income may be the ultimate solution to the issues that I have raised. And that is the real prospect that robotics and artificial intelligence will soon make many, many jobs obsolete. This is still a hotly debated topic and clearly we have seen many huge technological advances in the past. However, I do think this time it is different. Previously, it wasn't possible for machines to make themselves better without human agency. Now that is a reality. Machine learning algorithms and so on can teach themselves to be better, to find new ways of doing things without human intervention. 
One study done in Oxford suggests that almost half of all jobs could be done by machines in the next two decades. The current welfare state would be unable and unsuitable for coping with that eventuality. So to summarize briefly, to create a space for unemployed, pe unemployed people within the collective, we must accept that we too could be unemployed at some point in the future. So we need to imagine unemployment support as if it were us and not only something for undeserving others. Longer term, we really need to think clearly about what universal basic income could do in terms of allowing unemployed people to exist without stigmatization, which may itself hinder them finding work. Thank you. Hi, well, thank you for having me and thank you for coming. I have a lot of slides. I'm not going to read through them all, so they're going to be available if you need to read them afterwards. Um, but there's a lot of information on them. I'm going to be talking about class. Class has disappeared off the diversity agenda. It somehow slipped off all the European law, off most British law. It's not there. But as we know, historically, it's probably the one of the most important uh, relations of structural inequality that generates difference and underpins most forms of difference. So I'm going to begin with... Okay, so I'm going to argue there are differences we really, really cannot afford, and that is the massive redistribution of wealth upwards over the last 30, then 20, and intensified in the last 10 years. The top 1% of our society have managed to grab income and wealth. It's very difficult to find statistics on wealth because, of course, it's all about tax avoidance. So you can see there's been this huge increase at the top, and then at the bottom, we have this massive decrease in terms of wage freezing and the decrease <coughs> in types of employment, in unemployment, in zero contracts, in the race to the bottom. I put this book up because it's one of the most important books I've ever read, and it's about how, at the beginnings of industrialization, Capitalists were able to set workers against each other in every way. Slave owners wrote about disruptive slaves versus good slaves, and the various different nationalities were pitted against each other. Chinese groups were seen to be um, very well behaved and very good at being exploitable. Other groups were seen to be more problematic. So this book does this phenomenal historical understanding of that. What the welfare state did was actually assuage some of those differences, some of the competition between people. It enabled people not to have to fight against each other just to survive. It was incredibly important. But what we've seen is a huge, huge drop in welfare state spending. And so things like life expectancy in this country has, has decreased. Deaths have increased massively. I, could, I was trying to work out which statistics to include, and it's really hard to know in eight minutes. Um, but you can look at all these books which do massive statistical analysis. So spirit level, why equality is really good for us. Danny Dorling, anything by Danny Dorling. Danny Dorling's inequality in the 1%. Danny Dorling is fantastic. And then austerity bites. But Phenomenal statistical analysis of the huge class divide we're now seeing in terms of life expectancy, in terms of health. We look at what's happened to the disabled and a, a massive decrease in social mobility. What's significant is this is the total welfare state spending here. The majority of welfare state spending is on child benefit and pensions. 46% of it's huge. The thing I want to draw your attention to is how much estimated tax evasion occurs that could literally pay for half of the welfare state. If we could capture all the tax that we think we know about, and that's from the fantastic tax research units, and there's sure to be lots more, as Paradise Papers revealed, if we could actually grab the tax back, we could easily fund the welfare state we could have a society where people are not pitted against each other. So that's very significant. I was so shocked by this uh, DWP tweet that came out last week, which was actually saying, claiming to be living alone is one of the most common types of benefit fraud. And I just put those, put the emphasis, why do we have 
so much emphasis on benefit fraud when actually tax fraud is the real problem where all the money is going, where all the wealth is going, where all the inequality is being shaped. Why, and this is going to be my next three slides which are very, very quick, why do we have this legitimation? Why is it, it follows perfectly on some lessons which I didn't know, why have we seen the Victorian divisions between the deserving and the undeserving reproduced as the rich get richer? Why do we have that? I did a project on reality TV and that kind of follows into that. Uh, a large funded project which I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Um, but what was very interesting in terms of legitimation was how much emphasis was placed on shaming people who had to claim benefit through no fault other than their own in case they were disabled or something like that. So we looked at, and there's been some fantastic research that actually looks at the relationships between the Department of Work and Pensions. Do you remember A4E, the people who um, trying to put people back to work but were actually paying themselves 8.6 million as they did so, Emma Harrison. Um, and then this job that just horrified me so much, the fairy godmother, job mother as it's called, uh, was part of the A4E. So the links I want to argue, because I haven't got a huge amount of time, the links between legitimating the exceedingly rich who rob the state so they can't pay welfare benefits, and absolutely demonising the poor in the most disgusting, um, horrific, demeaning ways is very interesting, I think. This leads to, and again, it follows up perfectly, this leads to most people thinking that the drain on the welfare state comes from benefit fraud. The drain on the welfare state comes from tax evasion. So this was quite shocking when the TUC did this survey. Most people think that the proportion of the entire welfare budget goes to employ people. It doesn't. It goes to child benefits and pensions. So there's this absolutely massive misconception about where the welfare state goes, who's deserving and who's undeserving. And I argue <laughs> that it is that constant division into deserving and undeserving that allows people to think that people actually are undeserving which is quite frightening. <clears throat> this leads to misconceptions, and you listen to this every time you listen to the news, that blame the working class for voting for Brexit. I want to point out that it's one of the biggest legitimations we've had is actually the middle class that voted for Brexit, two-thirds of all who voted, and they came from the southeast of England. Again, look at Danny Dorling, look at the stats that came out of the LSE, we ran a big statistical analysis, very hard to do because they, they're very different uh, statistical forms. But contrary to popular belief, it was not the working class who are now being blamed by the middle class in the news, in the media, for voting for Brexit. Um, that's the map, actually, if you want to see it again. Brilliant, brilliant map of where the votes actually came from. And why is all the focus on the North East? Since I come from the northeast, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end with the differences that we do need. The difference that we do need are migrant labour. And I haven't gone through the nine slides on migrant labour um, because they're incredibly important. And if we go right back to the Wages for Whiteness book, it is labour that works together, that has solidarity, that can, I, that can find its strengths rather than pitting itself against each other that's really, really significant. Ooh, I'll go back to... So I want just to end to say that there are benefits to forms of difference when people work together, and there are definitely differences that we cannot afford when all the money is redistributed and sucked up to the top and the welfare state is cut as a result. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to come back to LSE and to present some of my research, which is centered on individual differences and personality. That means diversity among individuals is at the core of my research for more than 15 years already. 
And I have studied personality differences in different countries with different people and with a broad range of methods. And I've also been studying individuals of various other species, especially our closest living relatives, the great apes and monkeys. This may seem out of focus of this event, but it is not. In fact, it is highly insightful, especially for research methodology, because some basic issues become much more apparent in than in research on humans. And a fundamental issue that is at the core of my research is the clear distinction between, on the one side, what individuals do, how they behave, what they think, what they may feel, how they look like, and on the other side, what, we, what people believe individuals do, how they behave, what they feel, and what they think. And when studying individuals of other species, this distinction is much more apparent. It's obvious that we cannot know what an ape or a dog may be thinking, and we tend to be much more cautious about our assumptions, how they may think. We also have to conduct careful observations because many behaviors are different from ours, and often we cannot readily understand them. But we are experts of our own species, and therefore we feel competent to perceive others' behaviors quickly and accurately. We often even believe we could directly perceive others' feelings and thinkings, although this is not the case. And this distinction between what individuals do and how they are and how we believe they are is at the bottom of unintentional bias, also called implicit or unconscious bias. And people of minority groups, which could be defined by ethnic or gender identity, amongst others, often report they feel they are being judged differently for doing the same things. And most of us are fully aware that prejudice and stereotypes exist and can have real consequences for people. Countless statistics show that in the upper echelons of many organizations, women as well as black and minority ethnic people are still underrepresented. Our universities are no exception from this. Many of us have also experienced such, such consequences ourselves. But despite this, and although we may sincerely reject prejudiced ideas and may not even believe that particular stereotypes are true, it is still possible that they influence our behaviors and actions in prejudiced ways. And therefore, these biases are called unintentional. And therefore, they are so tricky to deal with. We all have prejudices, no matter what identity group we may belong. Over the last decades, <coughs> thousands of studies have demonstrated stereotypical bias across nearly every field. Biases about others' competencies, skills, behaviors are held on the basis of attributes that are therefore completely irrelevant, such as gender, skin color, hair color, body weight, religion, sexual orientation, and parental status, to name just a few. And this is because we have acquired a comprehensive body of knowledge about individuals. And this is not no universal knowledge. It is shaped by our social cultural community and ingrained in our everyday language. In the research I have conducted here as a senior research fellow and Marie Curie fellow at the LSE, I have applied evidence-based methodologies to uh, explore stereotypical biases <coughs> in our judgments of individuals focusing on assessments of personality. Personality questionnaires are quite popular. They are considered efficient means of standardized inquiry that enable accurate comparisons among individuals. And therefore, questionnaires are widely used in research and applied settings, such as for personal selection and development, and thus also to make decisions about people's careers and people's lives. Findings from questionnaire studies regularly reflect differences between people of different gender and different ethnicity. But it is still largely unknown in what ways personality ratings reflect differences that can actually be observed in everyday life. And in which ways they are biased by stereotypical beliefs. To explore the ways in which people, in which stereotypical beliefs about gender and ethnicity may influence our judgments of others, I conducted two studies, an online study and a video study. And um, in, the video, in the online study, people were shown these photos that you can see there. 
people with rather neutral faces, so there was not much to see. And you can see there were men and women and people of black and white ethnicity. And I didn't provide any more information about that. And then I asked people to judge these persons' personality. And people complained, about one-third of all participants complained, that one cannot judge personality of a person in such a neutral passport-style photo. I wholeheartedly agree with that. But still, we are so focused on photos. We have Facebook. We want to see people's faces, and for a reason, because we want to make up our minds about how these people may be as individuals when we once encounter them. So there was no information, and people were absolutely aware of that. And still they provided rating. If you don't know a person, you should go for a neutral score somewhere in the middle of the scale, and there should be no reason to judge these people differently. But this was not the case. So, for example, the white female was regarded as, or rated as more neurotic than the others, the white man as less conscientious, the black man as less sociable than the others. And I have asked people, why, what specifically, why did you make that judgment? And what does the question in the questionnaire mean to you? And um, I have asked these four people also to participate in a film. So I have produced four standardized behavioral sequences, four standardized film um, in a leadership position. And so, so that participants could see a film with, exactly, with these people showing exactly the same behavior, saying exactly the same things. And then I asked them again to rate these people's personality and to tell me what specifically they paid attention to in the films and how they understand the questionnaire. The basic findings are that a huge, there's a huge diversity in interpretation of what the specific question in a questionnaire means. What sociable means can be very different things from going out, from meeting others, from smiling, from talking a lot, from talking louder than others. And the important thing is that different participants had different ideas in their minds when they judged, made these judgments. And there were some slight differences in what they focused on in their interpretations of these four target persons. So, for example, for black people, outgoing was more often associated with being loud and um, attention-getting, whereas for the white man, for example, it was more socializing, going out in the pub. So I found a selective interpretation, a tendency for selective interpretation of personality terms. And also what people focused on in these photos, whether they smiled or not, was very ambiguous. There was no clear pattern. But there were some slight differences. It's not necessarily statistically significant. But also in the video, the white woman was judged very harshly and negatively for doing exactly the same thing than the others. So these are... Um, subtle pathways by which our implicit beliefs about people of particular gender or ethnicity should behave or tend to behave, how this influences our ratings of others. And my important point is here that by using such standardized scales, they do not allow us to accurately judge people because they're always influenced by the rater's beliefs about the person. And not just on the basis of knowing that person, but simply by, by seeing person's ethnicity and gender. And that's um, the point I would like to contribute to this conference. We need methods. We all differ from each other. And, um, but we, to, to use that also for job selection, we need methods that, that allow us to accurately assess that and to minimize the influence of stereotypical beliefs. And at the moment, with these rating scales, we do not have the right tools yet. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the other speakers for uh, your talks. Uh, I think my talk is actually going to um, draw on bits of everything you've all said, so it's quite nice that I'm going last. Although daunting, because I've seen how good all your presentations are. <laughs> um, my research examines the interface between autism, uh, which is understood to be a lifelong developmental disability that affects the way that people connect to others and experience the world, um, and also society. So it's interface with society, which shapes our opportunities for being social. This interface is very important to understanding how you can make enabling environments for people on the spectrum. Now, one of the challenges in understanding autism is the diversity it entails. We've all heard of the term, the spectrum, but what does that mean? What does it look like? Autism as a term covers a huge range of abilities and behaviors and also complex challenges that people face in everyday life. There's a famous saying that if you've met one person with autism, then you've met one person with autism. 
This challenge of understanding diversity leads to barriers at several levels in terms of how society meets, or rather fails to meet, the support needs of autistic individuals. There are sadly too many examples for me to list, but I can try and provide a brief illustration. Autistic people may have hypersensitivities to sound, to touch, to light. They may like to have things organized in a particular way and become very upset if there are sudden changes in routine. They may find social interaction difficult and unpredictable, leading to being overwhelmed and exhausted very easily. Now imagine you want to apply for personal independence payment to support your complex disability needs. For those of you that don't know, these are the financial benefits available from the Department of Work and Pensions for supporting people with long-term ill health or disability. How do you translate the complexity of your unique disability into a generic form? The form itself is structured upon several norms. That the nature of your disability is something that is entirely contained within your body. That your disability is invariant to context. But autistic people are misunderstood by society, which is a constituent part of their social disability. And this is sensitive to context. Now imagine you are invited to an interview with a health professional or a social care worker. If interaction, if difficulties in social interaction is the nature of your disability, could you imagine a worse, more torturous process to go through? Can you imagine trying to translate a lifetime of experience into something that a health professional who is unlikely to have any autism specific training will be able to understand. It's catch 22. Because there are no physical signs of autism, if you have developed strategies to make your life survivable, then people think you're fine because they have no window into your internal struggle. If you try to explain the complex ways in which your disability varies across different contexts, people think you're making it up and you're trying to get benefits for free. The challenge that we have is that the systems in place for administering welfare are not suited to understanding the nuance of diversity. The question we have is understanding why. We know from lifespan studies that autistic adults have extremely poor economic and mental health outcomes. So it's not for a lack of knowledge that something needs to be done. We know that policy is slowly changing, such as the adult autism strategy, although it takes a while to implement these changes. So it's not for an entire lack of government effort. We know from the perspectives of autistic people, especially through social media, that improving public understanding of autism is an absolute imperative. So it's not for lack of urgency. I've been invited here to say something about what needs to be done. And I'd like to use my privileged position in this debate to make one thing absolutely clear. We need to listen to autistic perspectives. We need to invite autistic people into powerful spaces of influence because the voices are there, but they are not being listened to. Now, I'm not an economist. I'm not a political theorist. So I'm not going to talk about the welfare state. I'm going to go a level deeper and talk about our psychological state of mind and how that influences the welfare state. One of the reasons autistic people are not listened to I believe is because their perspectives are not seen as socially valid on account of their diagnosis. This myth is wrong. From the point at which the term autism was introduced into the, into the clinical literature in the UK, autistic people have been largely studied from the outside, excluded from shaping the research agenda about their own diagnosis. Whenever a group is talked about, and that same group is excluded from the discussion, stigma and pathologization easily emerge. In this case, Having difficulties in social interaction is not the same as having no social validity. To understand diversity, you need more diverse ways of engaging with autistic people. Otherwise, the knowledge you produce is partial at best and stigmatizing at worst. So academia is one type of system which has served autistic people poorly. But that is changing, and it's through autistic participation that events such as Ought to Engage, which I attended yesterday, have come to fruition. Well, what about other systems which are not so critically reflective? And this is where I'm going to become the psychologist and ask you some questions. And I've no shortage of questions. Why is it that in a one-to-one -one interaction, humans can demonstrate a breathtaking ability for empathy with people they know nothing about, to be altruistic, to coordinate action, but when we scale up 
from interpersonal contexts to groups, to institutions, to society, that same capacity for unconditional humanity disappears. It even seems to reverse and become dehumanizing. Why is it that the process of creating standardized practices for administering care, why is it through that process that we are prevented from seeing the detail of human experience? People might say that we're finite beings, that we only have so much attention, energy, and money to be able to invest and inv address inequalities. But what about the specific inequalities that emerge and perpetuate when the resources required to manage them are free? Words of solidarity cost nothing. What about the implicit ways in which inequalities are normalized and legitimized by the structure of institutions and societies? Such inequalities can be hard to detect because they are often part of the social furniture of the world you're born into. It's also true that the only people who are likely to see inequalities are those that experience them. But should we just continue to accept them? If you need an illustration of what I'm talking about, follow the Justice for LB hashtag on Twitter. The Justice for LB campaign is led by Sarah Ryan, whose autistic son Connor died in care as a result of drowning in a bath following an epileptic seizure. Not only is this an example of a particular care system which catastrophically failed its members, but the legal process for understanding why is arguably just as humane, inhumane. In psychology, you would never get the ethical approval to cross-examine a vulnerable person about their trauma in front of a room full of strangers by a skilled interrogator. Both psychology and the legal system need to understand people's minds, but in one system, the aggressive means of doing so are unethical, yet in another, the system is the norm. To summarize, my message is this. When we scale up to institutions and societies, we seem to lose the nuance of human experience. And in doing so, we lose the ability to embrace and support diversity. But how do we address this? Well, in terms of creating a more enabling society for autistic people, it begins with promoting autistic perspectives. It involves questioning the way in which inequalities have become institutionally normalized so that diversity can flourish. And it ends with society being enriched by that same diversity. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a fascinating set of issues when we're talking about uh, questions about diversity and inclusion. Uh, right from talking about unemployment and how that's seen, uh, looking at uh, questions around class, looking at how unintentional bias uh, develops and, and how we assume that we know things, uh, and finally coming down to autism amongst many other types of learning uh, difficulties, uh, including dyslexia and dyspraxia and how people make judgments about that. Um, I, I uh, listened to a Radio 4, uh, BBC Radio 4 program about three or four weeks ago called A Culture of Encounter. And what the program was, asked, was, was kind of making the point is that we don't seem to have a culture of encounter. Right? Uh, we seem to say, oh, I, I know somebody who lives in, from Af who's from Africa, who lives down my street. I see them washing their car, I wash my car. And that seems to be our limits to encounters. And this whole argument around uh, how we make assumptions based on not knowing, we, 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 we think. So questions around unconscious bias. Uh, has, the BBC, for example, has moved a lot in terms of removing names and how names in, in applications Give, give out a feeling. And there's been a discussion, should we remove names of universities from people's CVs? Just have your degree. I got a degree in social psychology or something else. No name of the university. Why should that matter uh, in terms of trying to remove these notions of unconscious bias? So I think there's a lot to, to say here about how we all assume. And I, and I started by saying one of the other big giants, I think, is not so much um, sympathy but empathy, and I think a culture of candor as well. Why can't we say we don't know about this, rather than having to make a judgment uh, in, in relation to these issues we talked about? So we'll open up to the floor. Um, Alex, any questions? No questions have come in. OK. So who wants to ask a question? Yes, please. Sorry, can you just wait? There's, there's a mic coming through. Thank you for the presentation. My question is, can technology such as simulation models, virtual reality, and robotics 
enable those who are on the spe spectrum to adapt to and lead fulfilling lives in the modern world? Um, just here. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, that's not my <laughs> specialist area of research. Um, robotics and AI. Um, I don't know if it, maybe Cell can chip in on that since that was part of your talk. Um, I think one of the things that um, I get worried about when I hear about interventions and ways of supporting autistic people is the idea that uh, they're solely the problem. And so you have some, um, some technology which is developed to try and get them to interact in more neurotypical ways. Um, and so, you know, you have a lot of money being invested in very uh, complex uh, robotics that can sort of uh, uh, mimic neurotypical facial expressions. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I've actually seen the uh, Xeno project at UCL, which is amazing. Uh, it's an amazing project, and they're actually collecting a, an incredible uh, amount of data that's going to be very valuable for researchers in the future. But um, one of the things I've been worried about with other projects is that there's no critical reflection about the fact that it's a very assumed norm that the neurotypical way of interacting is the optimized way of interacting. And certainly from the research that I've been doing in my PhD, uh, one of my investigations was exploring interactions between autistic people because uh, there are actually enabling norms that take place when you remove the imposition of neurotypical norms. For example, um, autistic people are able to move on from misunderstandings very quickly, which is an, a very adaptive thing to happen uh, when you're interacting. They don't search so deeply for the causes of uh, social misunderstandings, or they don't read so deeply into taking p potentially offense at uh, certain things, and uh, uh, they can stay on task and, and move past these issues. Um, they also make very generous assumptions of common ground, which again is uh, from the outside, from a neurotypical perspective, it looks egocentric, but it's not egocentric if that assumption of common ground connects with someone else, it leads to fantastic rapport. So the interactions I've studied, I've seen um, very enabling norms that take place when you have a, a looser expectation of what social coordination is. Mm -hmm. And when you have uh, technologies being developed that are trying to reduce that, to focus on very tight social coordination, I think that there is some uh, epistemological problems with that uh, and so definitely I think the role of the technology um, needs to critically reflect more on the types of norms that are being assumed when it's being in the design process I think it would also benefit from autistic consultation as well I, I'm gonna assume that we all agree that difference is valuable and so my question is how do we protect the value of difference in a situation where the global industrial complex is based on creating sameness and a one-size-fits-all world. Would like to take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a go. Mm. Um, I think it's interesting because I don't think all differences are value. I really don't think class difference, um, the one percent, is a, is a value, valuable difference. So I think there are. We have to think about the difference between structural differences and cultural differences. Now, they obviously come together in terms of how people live structural differences. And that's when you get the horrors of things like reality TV. I also think we need to be quite cautious about which differences can be monetized and have been turned into profit in the past. So there was a very good article in 1995 about um, how the pink pound enabled a particular form of queer politics, how um, black pride got turned into kind of trademarks and commodity forms and various forms of narrow depictions of black masculinity. So I think we have to think about how difference, who uses difference for their own profit for their own interests. So I'd be cautious about the overall appreciation of difference. I think let's think about how we've got them, how they manifest, and in whose interests. 
<laughs> you want to come back on that or are you okay? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, while I hear what you're saying, I think the fast, if you were to take the, you know, 72 trillion um, that is the global GDP, <coughs> you would notice that there are a few large corporations shoving mm -hmm. basically the same thing down all of our throats, regardless of that. Um, and so I think there is still a lot of difference that we do have that's positive. Yeah. And you're talking about negative differences. I don't think we're all ever going to be the same, you know, from a class and a, an equality perspective. That's never going to happen. But there are plenty of differences that we do have in society mm -hmm. that are valuable that are being lost by this economic machine. Mm -hmm. May I contribute uh, some ideas from, from personality psychology of the question of why are there individual differences? What does it contribute to our thriving as a species. And um, there are some evolutionary considerations saying that this diversity within a species allows us to um, acquire and to have a broader portfolio of how we could be as a species. So we actually need this diversity to thrive and also to reduce intraspecies uh, competition. If we were all the same, we would all strive for the same goods, to strive for the same places. So we need that competition also to, uh, that, that diversity also to get along with each other. And I believe um, the diversity that we can observe in the human species is much larger than what we can observe in other species. And other species, and as, as I've said, I've studied also great apes, are highly complex also in their individual differences. But um, still, where the behavioral differences are not that pronounced as in humans, which is part of cultural differences and so on. So actually, um, this thinking that um, some economic models require us all to be the same, that would not function. Yeah, we need this diversity to have different ideas, different life experiences, different perspectives on the same things, to have new inventions, also to, to have individuals who are more anxious, who warn us for dangers. Yeah, so it's uh, that the more bold individuals go all oh, in one direction. We need also these warning individuals who say, oh, that may be dangerous, and that prevent us from, from going into directions that would drive us, as, uh, drive us as a community into the wrong place. So we need all these different voices to collectively end up with some more de better, greater developments and the better developments for all of us. Um, thank you very much for four um, really great presentations. Um, this question um, I'm thinking about from a perspective of my own work around diversity and inclusion and it's possibly for all although it's inspired by is it Jana's presentation um, I'm interested to understand how do you think we should be thinking about and reconciling the focus on individual and personality based difference with the very real collective and structural issues that we have in relation to these collective identities. And that seemed to be something that sat underneath as an idea all of the different presentations we heard. I'm happy to explain what I mean by that question if it's not clear, but. Yes, may I ask you to, to explain a bit more what you, what you mean by that? So I, the, the empirical um, evidence base seems strong in, in the sort of work that I've come across around unconscious bias, for example, or individual differences. But I suppose my concern is the way I've seen it adopted uncritically. So for example, recently we had, I can't remember which diversity and inclusion manager from a major firm came out and said, well, you can have a diverse room of 12 white males and that's fine because we're all individually different. And so, you know, there are multiple examples of this. I see it in my own work. I'll go into a room and I will present a, set, a series of evidence that cross different kind of categories or areas of difference and people will be like that's great let's just focus on this area so i'm i'm wondering what you know is the focus on individual and personality difference at risk of obscuring some of the structural issues and how how should we be thinking about that i would say if you would include other people as well then the individual differences would be much larger than just considering um white man so um, that also depends on what we understand by personality. I have a quite holistic understanding of individual specificity in all kinds of ways in which individuals differ in their behaviors, what they're thinking, what they're feeling. 
And if we just take a subgroup, like, like white men, of course there will be individual differences. But if we consider people from other ethnic diverse, um, minorities as well, or, from, or women as well, then the individual differences will be more complex and more diverse that we can observe in the entirety. So I, I think that's just a skewed argument to say um, in, we, we should um, um, focus on, on personality and that's enough diversity because all the ethnic background or the gender identities, all that influences how we are as individuals so that we can have far more diversity on the individual level when we consider people from a broader range of, of group um, differences as well. So I would not mistreat the, the concept of personality because it is actually very broad and I would uh, argue against reducing it to that artificial small ground on just individuals. This question in front. Come to the three people out there. Hi. Um, this is about, this is a personal thing. Um, three years ago tomorrow is the anniversary of the stroke that took a lot of my vision away from me. And a month or so ago, I was on my on Kensington High Street waiting for a bus. I noticed I, I use an extended white you know gesture stick and certain kinds of light, and if I'm going into a crowd to let people know that I, I can't see terribly well. And I had the stick you know at full length, and noticed two well-groomed women. We notice other people and how their hair is, and that's just normal. And um, when the bus stopped, it stopped in front of me. It takes me a little bit longer to get on because I've got to find the thing to hold on to and I, my depth perception's not good. And as I was getting onto the bus, one of the well-groomed women tried to get on at the same time, shoved me aside, and instead of saying, I'm sorry, said, ha ha, just like me to knock down a blind woman, ha ha. Who's the one who's different? <laughs> who's the one with the problem? <laughs> It was, I still, I'll, I don't think I'll ever get over it. It was so stunning to me. And she fits in, and I sort of don't. <laughs> I don't. Silence. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that. I, 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 I respond because my, my mother was blind, and that is not unusual. The absolute disregard for disability is, is astonishing, I think. Um, and it never ceased to surprise me as she got worse and worse in, in her capacity to move around space. So it, it doesn't surprise me, but it also brings us back to, to bigger issues of how respect is given to people who have various different incapacities. And I think we live in a remarkably cruel society. If you look, I mean, a lot of people in here, I'm sure, know much more about this than me, but if you look at the, the sanctions that have been applied to, to disabled claimants and how many have died as a result of poverty, lack of care. My mother, uh, you know, really suffered because she was unable to feed herself. So the cruelty around care provision in the welfare state at the moment is just horrific, absolutely horrific. And we don't need to live in this cruel world. It could be different. We could make different decisions about grabbing back all that, the, the, the tax and putting it into a different way. We could stop um, allowing social care to become financialized. You know, the majority of people who fund social care are hedge fund owners who flip companies. That The economics of care is, is brutal. And extraordinary. So for me, we have to change the cruelty, the culture of cruelty that has become normalized, that allows somebody like you or my mother to be just knocked over. To think that that is, is right is, is just so morally bankrupt. And I think we really need to change the moral terms by which we live. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I agree with the, the sentiment that there is a culture of cruelty, uh, but I don't think that it, it parallels individuals. I think something happens when you scale up from individuals 
to um, larger groups and institutions and societies where there is that loss of uh, empathy. Um, the experience you've had, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, I, I, had, I once was in um, M&S, uh, which is, you think, a very nice place to be. And uh, <laughs> a woman came up to me and I thought she wanted me to help her get something off the uh, top shelf. I couldn't quite hear, so I sort of leant in. And what she was actually saying to me was I should get the death penalty for benefit fraud. Mm -hmm. I'd never met this person before in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I sort of, uh, I, I kind of laughed and walked away because it was just too ridiculous to uh, imagine. But um, then I was just sort of reflecting, you know, there are generally people, are, oh, I had another experience at m &S where someone started applauding me. <laughs> m and is a, yeah. You in there a lot. It's, well, I... <laughs> I would like to, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not in there a lot. I'm not, I'm not your m and customer, okay? That is not my identity. Uh, it, these things just happen in, I think it was Waitrose, actually. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but no, I, I just bought something and the, the receipt slipped out of my hand and I tried to catch it. I took four or five attempts and then I caught it. And then a man just started applauding me. So you get this huge variety in terms of how, <laughs> individuals you meet on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, so people are varied. Um, and I, I do think that in an interpersonal situation, the, generally people try to, uh, when they don't have any stereotypes or any of those kind of barriers, when they know nothing about someone else, if that someone's asking for directions, for example, people generally try to help. But when we scale up to um, trying to administer care on um, uh, an industrial scale, something is lost in terms of the humanity. Um, okay. Sorry, there are a few hands up there. Hi, um, so this is a question for Celestin. Um, firstly, um, you mentioned about universal basic income and uh, it potentially reducing stigma. I just wonder whether actually the stigma would change to those people that work and those that don't and are on universal basic income. And then secondly, um, would it, is there a, a slight risk that if universal basic income was brought in by a regressive government that actually they would use that to justify taking away from public services. Um, and I think the red flag for that is people like Milton Friedman, who actually were the architects of Thatcherism supporting UBI. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. Z great questions. Thank you. Um, so in terms of reduction in stigma, so I try to argue if you get UBI, there is no longer a benefit claimant, but there could be person on UBI, right? Like who only has UBI. That is possible, but unlikely because I would hope, one of the problems with unemployment is we always think unemployed people don't do anything. Unemployed people do loads of stuff. Unemployed people look after people, right? They, they keep their older family members out of this care system that you just talked about, right? They volunteer, they do all kinds of stuff, right? So they do stuff, the stuff they do isn't wage labor, right? Um, and so I would hope, although I might be being too op optimistic here, I would hope that in the UBI system, uh, things like volunteering, um, looking after older relatives, um, looking after younger siblings, all that kind of stuff, becomes more valuable and normalized as like purposeful action. Right? So now, in the current system, you claim unemployment benefits, you go to the job centre, whatever you do beyond that has no purpose, right? It's like, if you're not applying for jobs, you're not doing anything that you should be doing. So that's the hope, um, but that is optimistic, and it is possible that you could get a situation where people who are, who are just doing UBI um, and not, don't have jobs still face the problem that you face today, which is when you meet someone new, they say, what do you do for a living? And if you haven't got a good answer, then you're not worth talking to. Okay, so that's, that's number one. I hope that's a decent answer, but you can come back to me. Um, and I did also allude to there is a massive problem with you have a regressive government, you have UBI, and all social support ceases to exist. And that would be terrible. That would be absolutely terrible. Um, but it is possible, which is why UBI has, has so much support from both right and left. 
So on the right, the argument is we give this UBI, we stop all, all kinds of social support, and it makes it basically easier for us to have a tiny government with no support for people. Um, I wouldn't be advocating that, of course. Um, I'd be hoping that we still have forms of social support for people who want to engage in it. But it's different when people can choose to engage in systems of support in comparison to when they are forced to engage in a system which tries to, as I say, shame them into <coughs> employment. So that's a big danger, big danger. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'd be here trying to make sure that that doesn't become the case. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing also that uh, India, for example, is experimenting with the universal basic income. Mm. And uh, the recent, uh, <coughs> the government recently, <coughs> when it demonetized uh, notes and is trying to push for a cashless economy, it's all to do with how you commodify, you know, you commodify transactions. So every transaction that's undertaken, somebody's making a profit from that. And, and the idea is you will get rid of the public distribution system, you'll get rid of free uh, midday meals in schools and so on and so forth, where the argument has been that with better nutrition, better iodine and salt and so on and so forth, could, could actually benefit people. So now that you've got the income, what are you coming to us for? Mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of danger that might be there. Yes. Thank you very much. Really interesting presentations. Um, two questions. One being, we talked a lot about um, people getting benefits and the unemployed, but I went to a conference within the civil service the other day and they spoke about one of the issues in this country actually being 8 million people being in poverty and in full-time jobs, mm, yeah. um, which is striking. So I wonder whether it's enough to take that step, give people an income, or whether we need to think about a more radical way of restructuring the entire system. Sorry, it's a really loaded question, but I just wonder about what your thoughts were. And the second one is um, really interested in gene modification and correction. So I know there's been a lot of chat about CRISPR and introducing this idea that we should correct um, so genes, so for example, cancerous genes or various sort of um, almost improvements in one's DNA. And I wonder whether that would lead um, to lack of um, diversity. So if you like, it would lead to a culture of sameness. Um, that's massively propelled by scientific breakthroughs. Um, so yeah, I just wonder whether you think that would be a good thing or, or not. As it was also the huge number of children who are carers. I mean, that's, that's been coming out a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, and how, um, yeah. Yeah. Will I say something briefly on the kind of poverty and being in jobs, and then I would like to hear what you have to say <laughs> on that. Um, so just contextually speaking, one of, the, one of the key issues of universal credit is that it now draws people in work into the sanctions regime, right? So, okay, it was already bad that if you're, and just like FYI, I was long-term unemployed, right? So I know, I, I lived it, right? So if you're unemployed, you go to the job center and if you do anything wrong, you don't look right on the day, you haven't applied for your jobs, whatever, you can get sanctioned, right? And I'll just interrupt because that was A4E doing the yeah. sanctions. Right. The 8.4 million right. scandal of right. Emma Harrison. And now, what, uni what Universal Credit does, and, and okay, I'm going to say something slightly controversial. I kind of like Universal Credit in the sense that it makes the system simpler. The issue is that number one, how much you pay out, right? Like how much money people get, but also that the system is punitive, right? So it's like you were unemployed. You, within the sanctions regime, you become employed, but you're on low wages. And now they can sanction you for not trying to get more hours, right? So that's kind of where we are. But what that means, I'm not sure like what, what that what, what that means or what we should do about that or how we should change the system apart from UBI, which I've been talking about all day. So maybe you have another thought on how the regime itself, the whole benefit system could be different. <laughs> well, it is, it's a massive question. It's a huge question because it's about um, enforcing regulation around things like zero hours contracts um, because that's one of the reasons why people end up in poverty um, and, and it's the working poor, they're the largest group of the poor at the moment. And I can't remember the exact figure, but it was, I think it was 26% of 
are all working. Um, but the, the real problem is with something like zero hours, it's impossible to get childcare if you suddenly have to go out to work. Mm. So it, and that means if you can't suddenly answer the call to turn up for work where you may not get paid, even if you turn up, uh, you will be sanctioned if you don't take that job. So right. the, for me, it's both the problems of the, um, the welfare state system itself, which is punitive, but it's also the real structural problem of zero hours contracts, which I think we underestimate mm. as a massive political issue and a hugely gendered issue because anybody who has to look after children knows they can't just go, oh, I'll go out to work and answer a job call now. They have to organise childcare. It's very difficult to organise. So massive, you, you've hit on probably you know, <laughs> one of the largest structural issues around how do we reorganise work. And the fact that all these zero-hour contracts have been considered legitimate, um, the, the massive move to platform jobs like Deliveroo, Uber, the type of uh, population that can actually do a lot of those jobs, they have to be incredibly agile, <laughs> they have to be uh, very disposable in terms of ability to respond. So we've got this massive restructuring going on, which literally is a race to the bottom in terms of provision, but no welfare state to support people. Absolute, where the welfare state was designed to support people through times of precarity, mm -hmm. through times of difficulty, we don't have that anymore because they get sanctioned. As soon as they drop, they get sanctioned. And the number of children in poverty in this country is a disgrace. Mm -hmm. You know, the seventh richest country in the world with massive numbers of child poverty. And part of that is to do with the fact that people can't get access either to uh, welfare, which should be supporting them through difficult times, or the only jobs available are zero-hour contracts. Jana, you want to say anything about the, the genes? The genes? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I would like to say something. About that. Um, the techniques that you mentioned when, are mostly used to... Um, to eliminate diseases that have a profound impact on an individual's ability to survive at all. So mostly these are diseases that occur very early in life, and we had some in the media, such as the baby Charlie, and um, such diseases cause an enormous suffering. And um, all families affected with, with um, such diseases end up in, in poverty and end up in unemployment because it's more than a full-time job to take care of that. So, of course, I know about these, um, the trade-off that we, in the long term, see of modifying our, our genome. But from a scientific point of view and on individual differences, I can um, reassure you that there won't be a risk that we will all one day be the same. Mm -hmm. Look at identical twins. They are genetically identical. But what we know now, there is an enormous gene-environment interaction going on from conception. So even though we have genetically identical individuals, all the environmental interactions, the hormonal milieu in the uterus, um, different life experiences that we have make us different also on the genetic level because it alters the activation and deactivation of genes. So there won't be any risk that one day we will all be the same just because there are some genetic and uh, modification techniques. So, as I said, I see the risk that there one day people may want to change properties that are actually healthy, like eye color, hair color, skin color, whatever. But at the moment, and I think that's physicians' task, to focus on these diseases and to help reduce the suffering that comes along with diseases we can't imagine, such as mitochondrial diseases, where it's almost impossible to survive with that at all. And this has enormous consequences, all what we, we spoke about here. Yeah, what support does the state offer for those who are affected with such a lethally ill ch children? What support is there? What, uh, how can they organize their lives, maintain their occupations? Um, and, and that's what we have to think about as well. Sorry, there's a couple of people in that row. I want to ask a question. Yeah. Yeah? I'll come back to you. Uh, is there evolutionary evidence for the continual reproduction of class conflict and inequality? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> evolutionary? You mean biological? Evolutionary or biological, yeah. I mean, the, 
<laughs> there, I mean, there's a theory in social psychology called social dominance orientation, which is supposed supposedly meant to have some kind of evolutionary underpinning. Um, and I think I don't want to do massive injustice to it. So social dominance orientation, go look that up. Um, but as far as I'm aware, um, there is some argument that in all cultures, there are like two forms of prejudice, which are about uh, gender and age. Um, and apparently this is meant to be universal. Um, but in my view, we are like beyond evolution now, okay? Evolution was a long time ago. That was in the sense that, in the sense that, right? We're not fighting for food and, and water. Right, okay, this is the... Brexit happen, ha hasn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Brett wins. <laughs> Joke of the night, right? Brexit hasn't happened yet, so maybe we will be fighting for food and water. But like, the, the, the era where uh, we human beings were evolving seems to be like long past, and we're kind of very pri privileged in the UK to kind of, I would say, act beyond... Uh, Evolutionary impulses. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, can I, sorry, can I just ask uh, why, why you asked that question? What what, what was your thinking? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I asked about your thinking, not a response. Well, it's, it's a pretty hot topic today in uh, culture, uh, intellectualism. Mm -hmm. so, like if Seneca Harris and Jordan Peterson, huge evolutionary biologists, come out. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm wondering how that reflects the social theories. Indeed. Well, I have done a bit in this field as I studied apes. And um, <laughs> evolution is going on still today. <laughs> <laughs> what is unique about the human species is the tight entanglement between biology and culture. So of course we have heritage, natural heritage, that we share with other species. And the way in which other species organize their social lives need not be informative for us. So when you look at the 400 primate species that we have, there is an enormous diversity of social organization. No one is like the other. There are monogamous species, there are species with harem, species um, with uh, small families, um, fish and fusion societies where many males and females live together, and we have our large anonymous societies in humans. So just because there are evolutionary patterns that we can observe in some other species and also in our evolutionary past, does not mean that we are just governed by these rules, we can't do anything that's not right. What is unique to the human species is our culture, and that influences us from, from conception, from what, how mothers are treated while they are being pregnant, the um, environments they are exposed to, what education we have. So it is a very simplistic, almost neo-Darwinistic thinking to say that's just evolution, it just happens, we can't do anything. We as humans have evolved a lot of societal structures. We're sitting here discussing our structures, our ways of dealing with each other, and I have moved on beyond the pure evolution that happens to, to species that can't talk with each other. Language has made a huge difference in human evolution. So we can sit here, abstract, and think about real-life problems without being in the, in the situation. And that helps us to develop new ways of dealing with them, to develop societal structures, to set in place some unemployment benefits that doesn't exist in, in, in the life of chimpanzees, for example. If they don't have food, they starve and they die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the reality of them. So, um, and we have developed means and, and ways, and that's what we should focus on. Of course, there are evolutionary processes taking place and some um, systems that can also be modeled with computational systems of how many individuals interact with each other, but we can beyond, go beyond it. We have these capacities. Can I, I just think it might be more useful to think in terms of logics. It was when you, you talked about the abstract. So there's very particular logics that shape mm -hmm. conflict. And historically, 
capital needs to, or capitalists need to, need to keep increasing their capital to survive in competition with each other. If you look at the logic of capital, that it's, it's built on competition. It has to be in order to accumulate and survive. So what we see is the logic of accumulation, which ends up, if you have governments that believe in upward redistribution to capital, having massive class conflict. Final question. Hello, um, I'm Lara, I'm a disabled person, so I just want to bring it a bit to disability. Yeah. Um, so obviously this government has taken us back 40 years in terms of disability rights. Um, I'm a visual artist as well, so I'm very familiar with the disability art scene. So I don't know if you guys are familiar, but there's a lot of very active uh, disabled leaders and activists in that scene, very, um, very passionate. So, so my, 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 one of my questions is, um, well, also, there's another aside, which is that uh, currently medical students are getting almost no disability equality training. So in a four or five year medical course, some of them are getting nothing. And I know that because I used to teach five years ago at Bristol University, and they used to have one week called Disability Matters. That was then turned into general diversity. So in a way, it's all watered down because you just get one day on each. But I'm um, sorry, so, so my question was, <laughs> um, obviously, I hope our LSE teaches the social model in different departments, in different layers, but, but how many academics or lecturers are identifying as disabled currently or are quite visibly disabled, if you, if you know what I mean? Thank you. I'm guessing as head of the diversity unit. No, I, I, <laughs> that, was, that was a few years ago. But I, I, I think, um, I, I don't have the figures to hand, but I, I think that the an important point is between mm. this notion of visible and invisible disabilities. Right? Or invisible. Yes. I, and, and I think uh, the question about um, mental health uh, issues, mm. uh, issues to do with genetic um, uh, 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 structures and so on and so forth. Uh, my, my son was is dyspraxic, and then he has then through some kind of genetic uh, flow from his mother, uh, he's um, <laughs> no 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 it does no, because we did the genes test. Sorry, we did, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he's got hypermobility. He's got pots. He's got Ellis Danlos and so on and so forth, and his school just won't see that because he was getting A-stars. So we took him out of school four years ago, and we have homeschooled him. Right? And I think this, and he says, when he's sitting down and he, somebody says, why don't you get up, you're sitting on a disabled person. He says, I am disabled. So the thing that you don't have this visible, so we make this assumption, yeah, that somebody was disabled. I, I, I think I'm mistaken to have said that. I meant self-identifying. I'm yeah. more interested sure. that I haven't yet seen somebody come out as disabled amongst all the beverage talk, so mm -hmm. I'm thinking more from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah. Disclosures um, of your identity is very uh, tricky because uh, at publicly it can um, lead to different responses to disclosing it individually. Uh, we had a question yesterday at uh, the Ought to Engage event about uh, we were discussing the complexity of that because uh, as researchers, uh, in order to be participatory and engage with your participants, you need to be honest and upfront. Uh, and if you know you have a diagnosis, uh, just you know, just to disclose these things in order to build trust. Because if you're not, then uh, then the trust relationship is complicated. But then at the same time, um, there are other challenges because publicly, there, for example, with autism, is so poorly uh, understood, and there's uh, so much stigma associated with it. Um, and there's also the challenge that um, some people don't know their identities and it's hard to disclose. Uh, this, it's an iterative journey, a process. So um, in terms of publicly sort of revealing things, uh, I, I haven't met anyone at LSE, but I haven't met everyone at LSE. Uh, <laughs> but I can, I can appreciate 
the complexity of why it, they might not disclose or, or the pressures for why they feel they should. Can I just say one thing? I, because I, why I'm really interested to find out from you because Obviously, you're tackling all these huge inequality issues, but I think I was expecting to, mm -hmm. um, you know, the famous UN phrase, mm -hmm. nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm hoping that there are, mm -hmm. isn't there in the uh, mm -hmm. inequalities department, um, <coughs> so a disability mm -hmm. specialist area? There is, uh, at the LSC, you have the Disability and well Wellbeing Office, yeah. and it, it deals a lot with student uh, issues around disability, and when students actually self-declare, putting in reasonable adjustments, uh, uh, right from examinations, extra time to borrowing books from the library, and so on and so forth. I think it's much harder for staff, perhaps, to, to come through on that. And I think the question is, if you do declare a disability, and you feel that nothing is going to actually be done about it, either through word of mouth and what you heard from other people and elsewhere, then the tendency is to not disclose it. And I think a physical one is much more difficult. To, uh, it's, it's easy that way. So I think there are, there are issues around, around that. And we, uh, the LSE has uh, recently, uh, we had an equal, um, equality, diversity and inclusion task force that ran for a couple of years, looking at a whole range of issues around, uh, including disability. And uh, a unit has been set up to, to look at these things. But I suppose uh, unless there is responses are forthcoming to the kinds of disabilities, and I said it's that's a whole range, that um, people don't feel that there's something there for them to gain from it. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's how I would see the current situation. We have uh, gone over our time, and, and nobody seemed to have made a fuss of wanting to leave. Um, <laughs> Is there, are there any other burning questions, one person, or shall we say thank you to our speakers? Let's say thank you to our speakers.